Thompson. My name is Ari Thompson, Director of Sales with Gosker Automation, Automation Within Reach. Uh, been with uh, Gosker Automation for about eight years now. Um, started in uh, some engineering capacities, designing systems, custom systems. Back in those times, uh, we didn't have a standard automation wing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about standard automation, not because we don't like custom automation, uh, but because simple automation is uh, really uh, the first endeavor to dipping, uh, if you're new to automation, dipping your toe in the water and really understanding what automation can do for you and your, uh, your facility. Something that everybody in this room, everybody that's encountering this show um, is, is experiencing currently are some of the common industry pressures such as a global competition, increased uh, uh, price reductions, shortage of qualified labor. Um, regardless of where you are in the industry, whether you're in Wisconsin, whether you're in California, Texas, or Maine, um, everybody in this country is experiencing a shortage of qualified labor. Um, unfortunately, due to uh, you know a, a decrease in, in people going into skilled trades, there's about a 40-year gap right now in the skilled trades industry. Uh, that's a huge gap to overcome, and it's not one that we're going to be able to overcome in the next couple of years. Uh, so you have to become, you have to start looking at opportunities, you know, with robotic automation and other automation platforms uh, to look for ways to offset those skill shortages. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, automation solutions out there to do that, investing in new technologies, investing in uh, standard automation technologies, as well as custom automation technologies uh, to help uh, amortize the skilled operators, the skilled uh, the operator skill sets that you have currently over multiple pieces of equipment and multiple uh, multiple work cells. In essence, you're doing more with less or, or what you have today. Oftentimes, people don't understand, you know, what an automation project looks like. Um, put it, putting it quite simply, it's the three Ds of automation. Dirty, dull, and dangerous. Is it a project that, you, quite frankly, people don't want to work on because it's dirty? It's an inherently dirty environment. Perhaps it's a... Um, a grinding application or something else that's very dirty, um, potentially hazardous due to uh, some of the fumes or, or um, the chemicals that I, uh, somebody would be doing that uh, task manually would encounter. Dull or repetitive. Um, this is something that really um, anyone these, this day of age doesn't want to stand around and do something that's monotonous. Um, that's a, a great solution for, uh, for automation, whether it be uh, fixed automation or robotic automation of some sort, but doing something to where the operator is loading up that work cell with raw material of some sort or another, and then calling up a program for the robot to unload, load that machine, hit cycle start, allowing that operator to go on and do something else uh, with a little bit more skill involved. Um, and then thirdly, and probably most, uh, most importantly, is dangerous. There's a lot of dangerous environments out there, dangerous assembly tasks, or perhaps uh, cutting tasks that people uh, risk the loss of limbs, whether it's fingers, hands, or arms. Um, those are uh, situations that are great for um, that are great for automation. Um, case in point, there's a, not too far down the road. We recently executed a, a project uh, servicing a forging press. Um, it's a, a, a three-stage forging press, um, you know, and that's a scenario where. Uh, it was very dangerous for operators. It was a very hot environment. It was a very loud environment. It was an uh, environment that people, operators, just quite frankly, didn't want to attend to. Excellent opportunity for robotic automation. Robot is going to be there day in and day out. It's not going to complain. It's not going to take breaks. And if uh, the end of arm tooling gets smashed in the uh, in the press, ultimately you retool it with another tool and go on live another day. Talk a little bit about Gosker and uh, automation within reach. So, uh, Gosker Automation has been a um, authorized integrator, FANUC integrator, for uh, over 35 years now. Really specializing in uh, CNC machine tending on custom uh, applications. We do a lot more than that. We do CNC machine tending. We do uh, palletizing. We do deburring. We do some painting, and we also do um, some assembly cells. We do a little bit of everything in in the uh, custom automation world. If you can dream it, we can build it, that's what I say. Um, but recognizing the trends in, this in, in the industry and recognizing the skilled labor shortage that we're facing, in 2018, we, did, we unveiled our Automation Within Reach group, which is a standard automation wing for Gosker Automation. 
The reason why we did this is we, is we do a lot um, on the control sides of things uh, and also with vision processes and tooling processes to simplify our custom cells so that they're, uh, they're very easy and intuitive for operators to, to be able to handle and manage. At the end of the day, it still requires a person with, that's a, a little more versed um, in PLC programming and robot programming than most, uh, most job shop manufacturers have in their repertoire today. Uh, with that said, we came out with automation within reach to really try to uh, put together really cost-effective automation solutions uh, with, auto, with um, conversational type programming where the operators in these job shop environments do not require any previous knowledge of robot programming or teach or PLC programming. Um, that is really key so that you put a standard automation piece of equipment into a job shop environment and the, the operator, the personnel that are there are able to operate that system with the knowledge that they, they have uh, today. So again, it doesn't require um, PLC programming experience or robot programming experience before. So trying to uh, decrease the amount of uh, skill there required to operate those types of systems. <clears throat> we actually have three different types of solutions within our uh, automation within reach umbrella. So the first one I'll talk about is a DC series load and go. Um, back in our booth, uh, booth 1120, we actually have a DC series load and go on an Akuma LB3000 currently. Um, this is an excellent platform for servicing uh, lathes, um, lathes of all, all types, uh, quite honestly, as long as you can get the auto door and the uh, robot interface as well as a few of the other robot friendly options on the machine, um, this, this unit can go on uh, a wide variety of different uh, brands of machines. The merits of the DC type, uh, DC series uh, load and go is that it has four drawers in a vertical configuration. So you have uh, a range of different parts, um, anywhere from a half inch to eight inches in diameters uh, by utilizing three different uh, part templates. The robot mounted on top is actually a FANUC, the uh, DC-1 is actually a FANUC M10 ID-12 robot, a 12 kilogram robot. Um, we can handle uh, two nine pound parts. Uh, so we handle one raw part, one finished part to unload, load the lathe. DC-2 is actually uh, the same unit, just a different robot that's mounted on top, just for increased payload capacity. That robot is again a FANUC M20 ID25, so a 25 kilogram robot. Uh, we can handle uh, two 18-pound um, parts in, in that solution. We also have the uh, DC3, uh, which is uh, utilizes again the same base configuration, only with an M20 ID35, so a 35 kilogram robot where we're have the uh, capacity to handle two 32 pound parts. Um, so dimensionally wise, uh, the, the units can accommodate anything from a half inch to eight inch diameter apart, really uh, catering to more of the slug type materials, you know, round, round slug, uh, some uh, square parts as well, as well as a hex bar stock. Anything from the one inch to the uh, seven inches in length range. We also have an RC series load and go. The RC series load and go stands for rotary cell. Uh, so this is a two-sided uh, uh, unit. We have a, a slant style bed on each side uh, with a wall in between. This provides the operator the ability to load uh, one side while the robot's working out of the other side, uh, picking raw material and loading it into a, a machine. The RC series is great for both uh, lathes and mills of all, uh, of all types. So again, uh, this unit here uh, can accommodate parts from one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch, and five inches in diameter. But rather than the DC series where we had an ultimate uh, upper uh, constraint of seven inches in part length, we can actually handle parts up to 11 inches in length with the RC series load and go. We also have the VBX series. Um, the VBX is actually dedicated to uh, vertical machining centers. It's, uh, it cannot be put on a, uh, on a lathe of any sort. Uh, so this is a true high, uh, high mix, low volume application. So we, this unit actually utilizes uh, shunk vices that come with the solution uh, and are placed onto the table inside the uh, vertical machining center, where then the uh, work holding that's staged inside the uh, VBX uh, 160 um, is then retrieved by the robot from the upper shelf. The robot then utilizes that work holding as part contact tooling 
and, and grips a raw workpiece. From there, that raw workpiece and that work holding is loaded into the machine. Um, so that is a true, uh, truly a unique uh, solution and allows this system to be very um, high mix, low volume for a true job shop uh, machining environment. We have a VBX 160, which is capable of a 6.6 .6 pound uh, part weight. And we also have a VBX 260 with a slightly larger payload of a robot allowing us to handle parts up to 21.6 pounds. Um, these are uh, excellent units. Um, one uh, Achilles heel of any uh, three axis vertical machining center automation is always the work holding. There can be a tremendous amount of expense added up inside the work holding. Um, with this unit, the unit actually comes with work holding, uh, which really uh, allows this system to be uh, the utmost flexible of a solution. <clears throat> All of these systems are, are designed to be uh, right around the $100,000 range. Um, every one of them requires a $4,000 installation fee. So the DC uh, series load and goes um, start out in a range of uh, $99,000 up to $114,000. The RC series actually goes from $74,000 to just shy of $90,000 for the RC series. And the VBX series comes in um, at just shy of $90,000 for the 160 um, and just shy of $100,000 for the VBX 260. So very, very cost-effective units. Uh, traditionally, what our customers are experiencing is a return on investment of uh, somewhere in the range of six months to a year. So an, an excellent value proposition at that. Talked a little bit about auto, um, you know, some of the standard automation that we have and some of the benefits of those units. Um, but perhaps uh, you know you don't have uh, parts in your in your shop today that are all cylindrical, they're all square, or all hex bar stock of some capacity or another. That's okay. Uh, we have a lot of different solutions, uh, you know, from a custom automation um, perspective that accommodates a range of, of parts that might be aluminum die cast parts with unique geometries, or even castings or steel castings or forgings, as well as some very large parts, perhaps uh, for very large machining applications. You shouldn't be afraid of these either. There have been significant advancements in uh, vision-guided robots, uh, specifically 2D vision. Uh, oftentimes, we'll mount a 2D vision uh, camera on the end of, on the robot's end of arm tool, so on the J6 of the robot, and we'll um, use that camera to determine the precise pick location of parts. Um, maybe it might be parts on an inbound conveyor, or it might be parts on uh, an inbound pallet. Let's say they're, uh, they're hubs, maybe they're uh, uh, cast hubs for the trailer industry. Um, those hubs are, are heavy um, and it uh, makes sense for those to come from the uh, casting house on a pallet. That pallet can be automatically introduced directly into an automated cell where the robot with vision can uh, hover over a precise pick location, uh, snap a photo, determine the precise pick location of that part, and then uh, go on to regrip it and load it into the, uh, the lathe or the, or the machining center. We also utilize uh, static or stationary mounted uh, uh, vision cameras as well in the 2D variant. Um, sometimes these are mounted over a, a small conveyor to determine a precise pick location of a smaller part on a smaller conveyor. Um, other times it's uh, a stationary mounted camera where the robot's presenting a part to the camera for radial orientation requirements or directional orientation requirements. But these, uh, these vision processes and these cameras that are mounted on either the robot or stationary mounted allow us to reduce the amount of complexity and cost in, in physical uh, fixturing of the, of the parts and, and tooling. Taking it one step further into 3D vision, uh, 3D vision is excellent for handling raw material uh, that comes into a cell from a, you know, a bulk container. So uh, let's say that it's a steel part coming from a casting house or a forging house in a, raw, in a raw container, rather than having an operator pull all those pieces out and load them into something else uh, to transfer them into a cell, the robot can utilize the 3D vision, uh, bin picking vision as it's often uh, uh, called, it, to uh, pick that raw randomly oriented material out of the uh, bin. From there, the robot would set it down onto a secondary station which would utilize another 2D camera to acquire the directional and the, or the radial orientation of that piece before that piece is ultimately loaded into the machining cell. Um, but there's been tremendous ad advancements in 3D vision technology with FANUC. We've actually worked uh, directly with FANUC over the years to 
try to enhance some of the processes and the add-ons uh, to uh, the vision processes to make them more robust and user-friendly. We get into, we see a large uh, variety of different vision applications. About 75% of the units uh, in the systems that we sell today on the custom side of the business utilize some form of vision, uh, whether that's FANUC 2D vision, FANUC 3D vision, perhaps even some Cognix or Keyent or, or SICK vision as well. We currently have a, uh, a project on our floor uh, which is utilizing some Cognex vision for a post-process inspection. These are uh, or cast parts where they go through a, a previous turning operation. Uh, there's also some drilling and tapping being done, uh, but they, as I mentioned, they're, they're cast parts. So we are utilizing two different Cognex cameras. Uh, one is uh, mounted uh, vertically, the other is mounted horizontally. We're checking for a couple of different things. First of all, we're making sure that there's not porosity um, on the machine surfaces. If there's porosity on the machine surfaces, we're taking those parts out. Secondly, we're making sure that an oil, uh, oil hole on one of the ID bores has been in fact drilled and is present. For second, thirdly, we're, in, we're making sure that the, uh, some of the other features are drilled and in fact tapped. We're also making sure that there's not a tap broken off in one of those tapped features. Um, all of this is enhancing the quality that's getting loaded, ultimately loaded onto the outbound material handling for transfer to their end user. Um, in a previous scenario, there was an operator that was tasked with manually inspecting, manually and visually inspecting every single one of these pieces. But there was a, a very large quantity of, of uh, bad scrap pieces that were getting transferred to their end user, uh, which was a very costly endeavor because they were paying for all that scrap to be trucked back to the, back to the facility. So this is enhancing, reutilizing technology and vision technology to enhance uh, the product um, and also reduce the direct labor content in those. There's also been significant advances in, in uh, system controls, such as robot programming um, and utilizing human uh, machine interfaces, such as HMIs. Uh, five years ago, it was 50-50 on uh, the number of units that left our facility with HMIs uh, on them. Now, 99% uh, of the systems that go through our doors have some form of HMI uh, incorporated. And the reason for this is because the human machine interface, or HMI as we call it, provides intuitive controls, user-friendly HMI dashboards, and conversational programming. There's also a, a, a great means of being able to diagnose faults and recover a system by the press of a button. This keeps operators out of the teach pennant and it prevents them from needing or, or requiring them to um, utilize the teach pennant to recover solutions. Uh, all in all, this requires a minimal teach pennant uh, interaction and uh, an enhanced operator experience. Significant advancement, advancements in flexible tooling. So adjustable tooling, if you would go back and check out our DC-1 that's back there located in the uh, um, in booth 1120, We've actually uh, come up with our own adjustable tooling that's utilized on all of our standard cells. We actually utilize this quite often, quite frequently, uh, in some of our custom cells as well. So these are uh, these are tool sets where we have a base jaw and a top uh, top tooling. Uh, it's where you utilize a Allen wrench, loosen up that, that set screw, you move the finger to the desired location. We actually have laser markings uh, relative to uh, uh, diameter ranges of, of the. Uh, on the tooling for ease of use. Taking it one step further, um, I, I guess I should add that the adjustable tooling is really good tooling for a slug type parts, whether it's be you know be square parts, uh, whether it be bar stock of uh, you know a round bar stock or hex bar stock, uh, something that doesn't have a significant draft angle on it. And when you go one step further into maybe perhaps castings, uh, whether it be uh, you know aluminum die cast parts. Um, steel cast parts or forgings, many times those parts have uh, significant draft angles on them. It's not really good for adjustable tooling because there's no compliance in the adjustable tooling. We like to use manual quick change tooling such as, such as a, a chunk quick change blocks. Chunk quick change blocks are actually a little block that gets mounted onto the gripper, whether it be a three jaw or a two jaw gripper. With a quarter turn of an Allen wrench, you can pop a finger in, pop a finger out. Um, and utilize some different tooling uh, and, and very quick changeover, although be it very cost effective. 
for a, a multitude of different parts that you might have. Taking, it, <clears throat> taking this even one step further into the pneumatic or automatic quick change tooling, this is where we have a pneumatic coupling, whether it be a shunk or an ATI quick change, mounted on J6 of the robot. You have a master side quick change that's mounted on J6 of the robot. This is always resides with the robot. And then you have a tool side unit, which is mounted on each and every uh, tool that you're utilizing in that cell. Um, when you're utilizing this type of quick change tooling, um, you have basically have a, a tool that's set up for every single uh, um, part, or every family of parts. And an operator would uh, go over and select a, a part number on the HMI. By selecting that part number on the HMI, that automatically calls up a routine for the robot to go and select the, uh, the tool required to accommodate and handle that part. So really going through the, uh, through the uh, sequence there from adjustable tooling really being the most, most cost effective, although be it uh, limited in terms of what it can handle really to uh, slug type parts uh, with minimal draft angles on it, then into the manual quick change, very flexible, um, but yet a little bit more uh, um, pricey there, and then uh, pneumatic quick change, which is certainly uh, the most ease of use, uh, user friendly, uh, but it's certainly the most most costly. I want to talk uh, ever so briefly about um, return on investment um, because we can go on for days and hours, uh, literally, about uh, factors to consider for uh, return on investment. Well, I want to tell a little bit of a story. Uh, we have a customer in uh, in Dayton, Ohio, that utilizes uh, eight of our cells. They, Early on, they purchased uh, two custom cells from us, um, and then ultimately we came out with our automation within reach products, our load and goes, and they, and they actually have six of those. They have one operator uh, that services uh, and is required on changing over and, and tooling um, all of those units uh, or all of those cells. That operator is very busy, but this is very much a paradigm shift, um, thinking about the normal job shop mentality to where uh, you're thinking of one operator, one machine. Um, this is, in this job shop, they actually have one operator servicing eight different machining cells. So the return on investment there is substantial. Um, many would probably think that their lot sizes are massive. Their lot sizes are not massive. Their lot sizes are around the 50-piece uh, lot sizes. So um, they have one guy um, tooling up those each one of those cells, changing over those, those cells, doing the QC checks in each one of those cells. And he's a very busy guy, uh, but it can be done. And that's, again, doing more with what you have with simple automation, uh, amortizing the current skill set and the current labor force that you have and doing mo and maximizing it. <clears throat> we also have a, a very large OEM um, in Missouri that we do a lot of business with. Uh, these, uh, on one hand, are, are very large custom cells that are uh, making uh, millions of one part number. But one thing to be uh, to note is that they have these machine metrics boards in every one of their aisles where we have these these uh, machine lines in there. They have a target rate and an actual for what that cell is, uh, has produced over the last eight hours. And in many cases, those cells have produced over their target rate. That's pretty that's pretty impressive. And and they're not the only customer that we see that with. Just down the road, we have a, a very good customer that ex has experienced uh, the same kind of throughput. But what's even more impressive with that large OEM that I'm speaking on is that efficiency is calculated on 96%. At 96% efficiency, it doesn't matter where you're manufacturing in the world. It doesn't matter what you're paying your operators in the world. Whether you're competing globally with China and Mexico and their, and their uh, pay rates. At such an efficient, such a, a efficiency, it doesn't matter uh, the, the late direct labor input uh, does not matter. So you're taking that out. From a manual uh, operation and return on investment, you want to understand, you know, the labor rates, including the fringe benefits that, that you're, you're paying currently, as well as the annual operation hours, direct and indirect labor uh, content consumed, as well as your current cell uh, sufficiency. About five years ago, Akuma did uh, a study on comparing both small and large manufacturers. Uh, what they found is that across these small and large manufacturers that were both automated and non-automated, uh, the non-automated manufacturers had an average spindle utilization of 
Most people believe that even in a manual scenario, they're much better than that, oftentimes twice, twice that. Um, but that's not the case. Automatically, when you go into, when you go into um, robotic automation or a fixed automation of some capacity, you're increasing that often by, by double or more. Um, so dramatic increase in, uh, in, in machine utilization, utilization for, and uh, spindle utilization, dramatic increase in operational hours, reducing the direct and indirect labor costs, and then also increasing your throughput, which is increasing the number of uh, pieces you have available for sale. That's all I have here today. I appreciate, appreciate everyone coming out and uh, listening to, to our uh, talk today.